Catalina here. I am filming on March 1st and not yesterday because I spent so much time listening to the Supreme Court case uh, on the student loans. So today's news will be a breakdown of what happened in the Supreme Court hearing. Um, I definitely want to update you all on that. Uh, I, you know, I thought about being a lawyer at some point in my undergrad. Um, you know, as a young person, I thought about the typical doctor, lawyer, all the typical career paths. And although my first job after college was at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, I decided ultimately that law school was not for me. However, and a part of it is because of all the little nuances of um, arguments as well as like lawyers really have to dot the I's, cross the T's. But anyways, the point is I was still nonetheless, even though I decided law school was not for me, fascinated by the Supreme Court case uh, with student loans. And so I want to talk a little bit about, um, first of all, the, sec the second ever um, woman to serve as the U.S. Solicitor General, Elizabeth Prolongar. Her chief argument was really um this suit represents who has standing to sue the united states government and also agencies who has standing to do that do individual citizens as well as states have standing if they disagree with something like there's going to be a major precedent set in this case of who can actually sue over an administrative action done by department um like the Department of Education. So that's one part of this case that was fascinating. Another part was that both sides of the political, I, I hate that this turned political, but it very much did. Both sides of the um, political spectrum, whatever we want to call it, I guess it's not a spectrum, it's pretty clear right and left in this case, but um, the left argue who has standing to sue, saying can state sue, can these individuals who don't get access to the program sue who is standing to sue, whereas the right argument was what's called a major questions doctrine, which is a theory that um, that uh, what power does a federal government agency have to do something that has really large economic and political impact, right? How big can an action an agency take affect the overall economy and political spectrum, right? That That's part of the rights argument. How big of an action can the Department of, um, can the Secretary of the Department of Education, Miguel Cardona, how big can his action be if it has a, if it has a um, ripple effect into likelihood of maintaining inflation on in our economy, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I thought that was also a super interesting way that the more conservative um, justices brought up the argument. And um, Justice Kavanaugh specifically talked about how um, in this pandemic, there were specific things that the specific actions the executive branch took that was allowed and then specific actions that was not allowed and what is really considered in the wheelhouse of the Department of Ed. And of course, Elizabeth uh, Prolongar argued that when it comes to a benefit, and many benefits cost many trillions of dollars, a lot of benefits like Social Security, um, that those departments that govern those benefits programs still have an authority to regulate and come up with rules for those benefits programs, and that this is a benefit program like Social Security and like any other program that, yes, it is costly, but it's still a benefits program and the Department of Ed oversees that benefit. So they have the right to make the rules around those benefits. I thought that that was really, really interesting because obviously when Social Security makes a decision, we're going to increase the amount or we're going to change the age. That has a really big um, financial uh, cost to the government, yet I don't see anyone suing saying, I don't see, I've not heard of anyone suing, maybe there are citizen suing saying, I, I sue, I'm suing because I don't agree with the change in social security age, you know, things like that. And that was kind of a, um, not kind of, it was what Elizabeth Prolongar talked about in terms of like the authority of the Department of Ed to regulate and um, set the rules for a benefit. And student loans is a benefit 
um, that the, the Department of Education oversees. So I thought that was also a fascinating argument. There are so many good arguments made that at this point, I really feel, I mean, I think it's very much um, a, it's very much, un, I don't know from, from just listening to the case, it was, by the way, almost four hours long of listening. It's very clear, like, what justices are for student loan forgiveness and and the justices that aren't because of their line of questioning. I do think that um, Justice Amy Barrett Conan, will, it, like, it looks, it sounds like she will come on the side of the more liberal justices. And there, there, there still needs one additional justice to actually favorably pass or favor, be in favor, right, of... Um, the program. So just to explain what the next steps are going to be, like after this hearing, right, that the Solicitor General comes and also I think it was the Attorney General of the state of Nebraska argued on behalf of the six Republican states, the justices will go back and they will have like a private briefing on their decision. And then um, the ultimate winner, I hate to say winner, but the ultimate opinion that has the mass, uh, that has the majority consensus will then author an opinion and then the other side will assign someone to author the rebuttal. And um, they generally assign the justices, but then of course, you know, they have clerks and stuff that actually do the writing. Um, they don't actually author everything on their own. They might review it um, and kind of put their signature by it, but they don't actually author everything themselves. So I'm, so we don't know. It's like, that's a private briefing. It's not like we're going to know right away. It's going to take at least several um months. I'm turning down the volume so you don't hear my slack pings. Um, it's going to take several um, months to actually get a public opinion on this. So it's not like we're going to know right away. Essentially, the pause is until June 30th, 60 days after June 30th, or until the Supreme Court publicly rules, and then it's 60 days after that. So just to clarify, what does that mean to student loan borrowers? It means we're sitting in limbo right now, I thought what Justice Sotomayor said was very interesting as well. Um, and she said, why are we, the Supreme Court, being expected to rule on what's best for students in, or I'm sorry, graduates, um, or, or those that have student debt, borrowers, I should call them, because not every, so four out of 10 do not graduate, so they're not graduates. Um, she said, what authority do we have over someone that actually has expertise and have all the data around the impacts to borrowers, how do we, the Supreme Court, how are we more equipped to make the decision than the people actually appointed with the expertise to make a decision on behalf of, you know, millions, 40 million borrowers? Um, well, there's actually, yeah, about 40 million. There's almost 50 million borrowers, but the impact of this forgiveness will impact around 40 million borrowers. So she brought up that as an interesting point. Um, and another argument that I thought was interesting that um, Elizabeth Prolongar made is that the Republican state, like especially the state of Missouri, say, you know, well, it's going to hurt our tax base because Mohila is in our state and um, they're a quasi government because the government helps set them up, although they're still a private entity. And that the lawsuit would have uh, and this actually Justice Amy uh, Conan Barrett asked, like, why isn't Mohila suing? Wouldn't this case have more standing if Mohila just came forward and sued? Why is the state of Missouri suing and not Mohila? What right does the state of Missouri have over Mohila to sue? Why isn't Mohila themselves suing? Mohila themselves is not suing, and the state of Missouri had to file all kinds of sunshine claims to get data from Mohila. And Mohila was not exactly participating in the Republican lawsuit. And there was questions around why isn't Mohila just suing? Actually, no, I'm sorry. It was uh, it was Justice um, Elena Kagan who asked. Usually we don't allow one person to step into another's shoes and say, I think that person is suffering harm, even if the harm is very great. So why isn't Mohila responsible for deciding whether it will bring the suit? I'm sorry. I, I... So that was Justice Elena Kagan, which I thought was very um, 
an interesting point because that would actually give the lawsuit a much greater standing than six Republican states suing because these six Republican states have kind of ancillary harm. They're not directly harmed by student loan forgiveness, right? Later on, Kagan pointed out the state of Missouri was so disconnected from Ohila that the state has to file an open open request, open records request to get records from Mohila that they needed for the lawsuit. So Mohila was not participating. I want to make that very, very clear because I think um, Mohila is a contractor for the government. And I don't think politically Mohila wants to sue their own client because the government is essentially their client. The government pays them to service federal student loans. They do not want to be suing their own client, right? So, and they also... Um, this time we're not making payments. They're still getting paid their monthly fee to maintain the accounts. Um, they're still being made right. Maybe they're not making as much money, but they're still being made right, even though there's been a pause. And I think that's probably their hesitance to sue. Additionally, I don't think it's favorable for them as a as an entity, an organization that especially that's managing public service loan forgiveness and they get paid more for managing that program, it's not politically favorable um, for the Department of Ed to renew their contract with Mohila if Mohila is actively suing them. So it does not hurt, it, I'm sorry, it does not benefit Mohila as a private entity to sue their own client because they may not get their contract renewed and that just makes no sense, right? In addition, how many people will hate them for being against loan forgiveness and being accused of trying to line their own pocket, right? So I can understand why Mohila does not want to actively participate. Um, I, and I'm, I'm reading some of my notes. Justice um, uh, Brown, Jackson, also pressed Campbell on whether the supposed harm the loan forgiveness program would cause Mohila is really an established standing for Missouri. So just saying, hey, state of Missouri, I don't understand how this really affects you why are you arguing for Mohila, right? So um, Barrett may be the justice to watch. That's exactly um, that's exactly what I put down here because even though she was appointed by President Trump and being um, a conservative justice, um, it looks like she's leaning based on the legal legal arguments of do these states have the right to sue. It looks like she may be a tipping vote, but her vote alone isn't enough because it's a majority conservative, a majority conservative appointed um, Supreme Court that the Supreme Court case in order to rule on the side of those in favor of loan forgiveness, it needs one additional vote. So that's kind of the takeaway. Justice Amy Coney Barrett has stood out among the conservatives for asking particular pointed questions for the GOP states about their standing arguments, setting her apart from potential pickup votes for the for the court's three liberal members. If Mohila is an arm of the state, why don't you just strong arm Mohila and say you got you got to pursue the suit? Barrett asked Campbell among several questions she has asked him about the state's standing claims. Other, another sign of skepticism towards the state's standing argument. The states are the six Republican states, by the way. Um, I'm reading a few things from CNN politics, by the way. Um, in another sign of skepticism towards this, uh, the six state standing argument, she asked whether the state of Missouri also filed a lawsuit to vindicate the interests of the the city of St. Louis. So it's interesting saying, hey, actually, the tax base, right, tax base is, um, is will affect the city of St. Louis, or are you filing on behalf of them? Even if Barrett swings to the liberals to vote, the lawsuit should be rejected because of the standing concern the Biden administration will need the vote of one more GOP-appointed justice. That's exactly what I was saying, and I do think Sotomayor raises the practical stakes of the case. And of course, Sotomayor, I love what she says because she brings back to the table and, and also the opening argument of uh, Solicitor General Elizabeth Prolongar. I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her last name correctly, by the way. And by the way, I'm not an attorney. I have no legal. It's just me listening into the case and finding it fascinating, reporting to you all. But disclaimer, I am not a lawyer. I have no legal expertise. I'm just a listener. 
um, fascinated by policy and student loan policy and want to make sure to report the news to you all, right? Sotomayor, um, and and I'm sorry, Amy Prolongar said, you know, um, we're trying to right the harms the pandemic did to so many borrowers, and we don't want to put them in a worse off position before the pandemic because it's projected that so many people are going to go into default once payment starts, and we want to... We want to right the wrongs of the pandemic for these student loan bars, essentially. She didn't use those words exactly, but that was part of her opening statement. And so Sotomayor was coming to like the major point, too. There's 50 million students who are who will benefit from this, who today will struggle. Many of them don't have assets sufficient to bail them out after the pandemic. They don't have friends or families or other who can help them make these payments. She was remarks. Those debtors will suffer in ways others won't because of the pandemic, she said. So she's trying to bring up and support the point of the Solicitor General. We are going to make a decision that can make it or break it for 50 million Americans. Granted, not all of them, but the majority of them earn under 75,000. So they're truly moderate income Americans, right? Um, they aren't 10 to 20 grand isn't going to have huge impact on necessarily like the doctor or lawyer that makes a lot of money that or that owes 300,000. That's not where the biggest impact is going to be, especially since there's a, a an income cutoff, right? The biggest impact are going to be to truly moderate um, and lower income Americans who did struggle in the pandemic. So that was her um, case in point. And um, what you're saying, uh, we're now going to give judges the right to decide how much aid to give them instead of the person with expertise and the experience, the secretary of education who has been dealing with educational issues and the problems surrounding student loans. Basically saying what I said at the beginning, right? Like um, we don't have the expertise. We don't understand bars the way the, the, the secretary of education does. Why are we making these decisions? So I just thought that was really interesting. Conservatives ask if Biden's plan is fair since not everyone benefits. So like any benefit program, not everybody benefits. There's people that collect food stamps. Like if you don't collect food stamps, you don't benefit. But does that mean you have the right to sue the government for offering food stamps? I don't know. It just seems like that argument can't really stand either. But we'll see. Like um, we'll see what ends up happening. Um, the justices who question fairness of the program peppered Prolongar with questions of whether Biden's proposed student loan program is fair to respect to the people who don't benefit, those who've already paid off their be um, their debt or never took out a student loan to begin with. So I, I just think, I don't know, I, I, I don't buy that argument because, I mean, I, yeah, I just don't buy that argument because there are benefits that um, are for specific groups of marginalized people or low-income people, just like food assistance, right? Just because I don't get food assistance, do I have right to say, well, it's not fair. Why don't I get free food? You know, it just, it, I don't get free food because I make enough money to buy my own food. I don't need free food, right? So I don't think that that argument makes any sense. Or someone who collects disability because they're disabled, well, why don't I get disability? You know, it's like, because I'm not disabled. I, I, I don't get disability checks, right? So there's all kinds of arguments. I don't know if I buy any of that. We'll see. Arguments of fairness. I don't know. It just seems to me like that's a very weak argument. And I don't know if there's any legal. I don't know if there's any legal standing, right? Um, and of course, the line of questioning received pushback from liberal members, including Sotomayor, who said inherent unfairness in society because we're not a society of unlimited resources. There's inherent unfairness. I think the bottom line answer to be everyone suffered in this pandemic, but different people got different benefits because they qualify under different programs. Correct. That's exactly what I was saying. Right. Um, we're not all treated equally. And I believe in a society where this is now my personal um, preach in a society where we help those less fortunate. We should help those less fortunate. We shouldn't dole out the same help to everybody, even if they don't need it. That doesn't make sense. I mean, I, I do think there are programs that are u universally universally supported, like Social Security, because we all get it when we get to a certain age, but we all pay into it, right? So it's a benefit we get because we pay into it. If we don't pay into it, we don't get it. So you get it because you pay into it. It's different than um, a program that we give extra help to because it's a marginalized group of people, right? So um, I do think it's a very fundamental, not that I'm religious, but a very fundamental, because a lot of conservative people are, 
religious thing. Like you help the poor, you help those less fortunate. So anyways, that's my random rant. I've gone on for 20 minutes. I hope you got a really um, good breakdown of how the Supreme Court case went. I will update you when there's any um, actual rulings, opinions written, um, and any takeaways. If you are confused or want to know what you could do with your student debt, you can still get a free analysis and plan app.mylonesense.com. Let us know on standby. Please comment. Please like. Please subscribe. And we will make comment based on what your comments and questions are. Thank you and have a great day.